by way of a, a quick introduction to uh, Michael Pinto from uh, Wonder Makers based in North America in USA. I'll leave him to do a quick introduction to himself in a minute. But I met Michael at the start of the year when I was over in the States. And if I'm brutally honest, I knew really nothing about mold other than it's not really a good thing. That's about as much as I knew about mold. But Michael, you've gone on to make this a bit of a specialist uh, subject and you studied it uh, at length. And I think um, what you have to relay to surveyors is hugely important. Uh, so I would encourage everyone who's online and those who are watching it later, just do pay attention to this because it's part and parcel of health and safety really. And uh, without further ado, Michael, I'm gonna let you crack on. Um, I'm gonna operate your slides and uh, here we go. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Mike. And I appreciate everybody who's uh, listening and or uh, listening later on the recordings and stuff. Uh, this is kind of my uh, wall of fame here, if you will. Uh, all of this is just to say that I know a lot about mold and uh, uh, become an expert on it. And when you write a textbook of 360 some pages, the next thing you know, people expect you to be an expert. So I try and live up to that. And it's uh, taken me into a lot of interesting areas. I did not know much about marine surveying. Uh, I'm not a yacht owner myself or anything like that. I've got a brother-in-law who's got uh, several nice uh, size uh, uh, boats and things. But until two years ago, I had very little information about marine surveying. Uh, but when the question came up and the issues came up and there was a significant case of somebody getting sick from mold on a boat, uh, that started the delve into this area. And unfortunately here in the States, a lot of times that is as an expert witness in a legal case. And so uh, that's what uh, drove it all. Uh, go ahead there, Mark. We're gonna jump in and show people what's coming up here during the presentation. Uh, just a bit of an overview, not sure exactly what sort of information people have coming into this presentation. So we're gonna start real basic. What is mold? What are the potential health effects? Um, believe me, there's hours and hours I could speak on both of those. But uh, we'll keep that fairly short. Then we'll talk about uh, some of the common locations you can find it as uh, during your surveys, um, whether it actually is mold or some lookalike product and how you might be able to identify that. And then I thought I would uh, help you with the back end of it. If you're gonna write up um, a recommendation uh, to the owner to deal with it, you should put in at least a little bit of information about what the standard of care is for the remediation of the mold. And that uh, basically involves some of the physical removal and cleaning. Uh, the whole spray and pray uh, thing where you just spray some chemical on it is generally not uh, what, what you're gonna wanna recommend. And then I'm just gonna finish up with a couple of liability issues. And I understand that um, you know, that is gonna differ worldwide, but there is some general things you know, where you have to uh, do your surveys and do them in a professional manner. That's gonna be something that's gonna be held uh, across the board. So let's jump right into it here and talk about exactly what is uh, the mold. And uh, just to summarize the whole presentation here, if you're not aware of it already as surveyors, there really is over the last 20 years in particular, uh, a huge growth in the information we have related to mold. And it now tells us that it's not just something that's unpleasant or um, is a, uh, you know, issue just on the surface. Uh, it can be identified and it needs to be identified during some of these surveys because it can be a significant health um, uh, issue for the potential occupants. And we have more and more individuals who are having um, underlying health problems uh, that are uh, buying some of these vessels. And so you just want to be sure as a surveyor that you're just aware of this as you're going through. If it looks like this, it's all beautiful and clean, that's one thing. Uh, if it looks like the next picture here, uh, that's gonna be something completely different. So uh, this one was um, wrapped in storage and you got a nice uh, uh, you know, bunk area here. And you can see that's not just a pattern on the fabric that is actually um, uh, fungal contamination, both on the ceiling and then on the uh, mattresses and the uh, cushions and things in that bunk area. Uh, so moving on, we're going to uh, tell you that there's mold in all these different uh, areas. Pretty much you can find uh, mold or uh, different types of fungi from stem to stern. And this particular diagram here uh, gives you some of the areas. I know it's not the greatest uh, illustration, 
but it's, it brings home the point that you have to be prepared to identify this in just about any area of the vessel. And when we talk about mold, we're really talking about, uh, and I use the terms interchangeably, fungi, uh, but that whether it's mold or yeast or mushrooms or something else, uh, that's in that particular kingdom of organisms. Uh, if, it, if it looks and it smells uh, like it might be uh, organic growth and we have to deal with it. So then that brings us to the whole idea of if it is mold or some sort of, uh, of fungi, what do we need for that to grow? And uh, quite bluntly, it's pretty basic. Uh, it needs some nutrients, it needs some water, and it needs uh, what we would call a starter spore. That would be the equivalent on a microscopic basis of a seed from a plant. But in this case, they're not plants, so we call them spores. And you can see the relative humidity range that is best for them, although uh, higher relative humidity right up into 100% where you've got water dripping from surfaces and things may also uh, be uh, hospitable as well. The temperature range there is uh, going to get you, uh, again, just about any location in the world is going to have temperatures uh, in that range. So, um, and the spores are going to be all around us because they're carried on the wind, even out into the middle of the ocean. Uh, we had a, a report recently of some uh, U.S. East Coast allergy um, numbers that went way up. Uh, for a period of two or three days that was uh, tracked back to uh, spores that had blown across from Africa, uh, came across the entire Atlantic Ocean, and then impacted the uh, uh, United States eastern seaboard. So those spores are all around us. Um, moving to the next one there, as I said, they're all around us, and the uh, fact that they're very diverse, um, means that we have to be uh, careful. We've got a few, um, uh, Mike, if you want to punch that, there you go. The arrows will start to pop up here and you can see uh, different types of spores that are considered to be either what we call um, indicator spores, that's the two yellow ones, the aspergillus and the penicillin, or the five red ones are what we would call target spores. And this is necessary because there's so many different types of mold spores out there and mold species out there. Um, the good news that there's only a small number of the uh, hundreds of thousands of different types of molds. There's about a hundred that are known to be very, um, you know, cause health issues. And of those hundred, these seven are probably the ones that are most common not just in the US, but Canada and throughout Europe and even uh, the Middle East. Um, things change just a little bit in Asia, but not much in terms of the, um, you know, the more dangerous type of spores. So just very quickly, the two yellow ones would be aspergillus and penicillium, if you ever happen to hear those or see those on some report somewhere down the line. And then the five red ones are trichoderma, stachybotrys, memnalia, ketonium, and fusarium. And of course, the stachybotrys, if anybody has heard about a specific mold, they've probably heard that one. Um, the stachybotrys probably has the best press agent. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear it described as the deadly black mold. And if you do hear it that way, notice that uh, typically the register of the voice of the person saying that will go down. So it's always deadly black mold. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. That's just the way that people describe it. And it does have more significant health uh, effects on people. Um, so most of these that are uh, causing the health problems are not the rot molds. So that's interesting because from a structural perspective, the rot molds are going to be the ones that uh, cause you the most problems in terms of, um, you know, repairs and that sort of stuff but those aren't generally the ones that cause the most from a health effect standpoint. It's the ones that just grow on the surface, like that picture we showed in the bunk area just a few slides ago. So with that, we're gonna talk about uh, the primary consideration here is moisture uh, for these. Um, there has to be at least some um, surface moisture. It is, um, once mold is growing as a colony, uh, a high enough 
relative humidity can support that growth, but to get it started, just like in this picture in the center here with the water droplets on the uh, edge of that hatch, you can see by the black gasket and then on the wooden frame of that hatch, um, right in there, thank you, Mike. Uh, that's what you're gonna need for that mold to grow. And then you can also see in the very corner there, uh, where the two uh, wooden pieces come together, you can see the mold grow starting and then uh, on the wooden facing uh, on the edge of the hatch uh, later on. But if you don't have a situation where the temperature and the relative humidity or an actual moisture source allows that to uh, form some sort of water droplets, you're not going to get the actual start of the mold. Once it does start, you can see there from the chart on the left uh, that different types of mold, some of them are gonna need more water to continue to grow. In other words, it's gonna to have to be close to a saturation point on the uh, surface or in the material uh, where other ones like those aspergillus and penicillium, the one that we call indicator molds, those oftentimes will just grow um, with very um, relative humidity that might not seem too bad, 75, 80%, um, although that's fairly high. Uh, you, a lot of times at that level of relative humidity, you won't see the water dripping from the surfaces and things. So in addition to the mold, the, or in addition to the water, the mold needs an external food source. Um, and, you know, plants grow in soil. Uh, mold grows on surfaces for the most part. And just about anything that's organic in nature uh, can serve as a food source. So your wood, your fabrics, uh, your paper, uh, there that uh, picture on the right is uh, behind some plasterboard, the paper on the plasterboard, that is uh, gonna be your stachybotrys. That black mold there was actually determined to be stachybotrys. Um, but uh, the glues, the mastics, the interesting thing is you'll often see it grow growing on rubber and plastic and even glass, metal, and that's not because the rubber, the plastic, or the glass is actually providing the food source. It's because the food source lands on that. Dust particles, skin cells, oils, uh, you know, again, from people touching stuff. Uh, even on a glass mirror, that would be enough for the uh, mold under the right condition to grow on that uh, glass surface. Now, the paint, interestingly enough, on the backside of a mirror, that silver paint, actually has enough um, organics in it that the mold, if it gets started, will grow on that. And that's why you see those older mirrors that have the edges that are all kind of uh, dappled and stuff because the mold has actually worked its way in from the edge of the paint at the interface with the paint and the glass. Uh, as far as temperature goes, we already mentioned uh, from, you know, uh, zero to about, um, 42 degrees Celsius, and that's, uh, for those of you who are over here in the States, that's basically from freezing to about 108 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And the illustration here is just, it's, uh, we have uh, fungal contamination and everything from desert environments to Arctic environments. So um, the weather's probably not going to help you much in terms of controlling the mold. Uh, and again, another little chart there just in terms of uh, different temperatures that are preferred by different types of mold. Uh, and last but not least in terms of the basics about the mold is it doesn't need light. It's not a plant. It's a different uh, kingdom of organisms. Uh, whereas plants need sunlight or some outside energy source to grow, the fungal materials um, are designed to break down this organic material. And a lot of times, you know, if a tree falls in the wood, uh, uh, between the tree and the ground, there isn't necessarily a lot of light. And so the mold is designed to actually um, uh, take care of that sort of situation. It doesn't need that external energy source like the sunlight. And because of that, if you get uh, moisture and many of these uh, vessels have um, moisture resistant uh, finishes, whether it be um, you know plastic uh, uh, finishes in the bathrooms and stuff or vinyl wallpaper. If you get moisture behind that, you're often going to have the mold growth. And uh, this is a situation where there was a significant amount of uh, growth uh, because of some uncontrolled water that got behind the vinyl wallpaper. 
your response in a situation like this is the paper's going to have to come off as well as the underlying um, substrate, uh, the plasterboard or the uh, gypsum or something like that. All right, let's jump into uh, the potential health effects here. Uh, this is another great set of photos, uh, the outdoor section of a, a vessel there, and you can see the, um, the captain's chairs and the uh, padded edging and everything, and that just wasn't covered or cared for properly, and it's got a fair amount of fungal growth on it. It's not just dirt, uh, it's a combination of dust and debris and actual fungal uh, contamination in this particular case. Would that be a health effect for somebody or could that cause somebody to get sick? And the answer is yes. Less so because it's on the outside, but um, uh, the fact that there's that much of that, uh, either the person who's cleaning that or the individual who is the, uh, perhaps the owner operator that takes it over uh, might have an issue with that. So uh, jumping on to the range of health effects here, I will tell you that I don't want to be over dramatic here. I don't want to say, you know, that the mold can kill you, but the mold can kill you under the right circumstances and the wrong type of mold and the wrong concentration. There actually have been uh, situations where it has led to people's death. Uh, most of the time that's from fungal infections. In other words, they're working in a confined space. They're not wearing appropriate personal protective equipment. They're removing a lot of uh, plasterboard or vinyl wallpaper or something and just have a massive exposure of spores. Um, some of those spores actually, based on the temperature range and the fact that your lungs are, are full of fluids, will actually grow in your lungs. And so you get these fungal infections and um, fungal infections in the lungs. You talk to any of your medical friends, they'll tell you those are very nasty. And those uh, can and often do lead to a death. Um, some of the other problems, the allergens and the fact that it creates allergies in people, um, they generate these volatile organic compounds as they grow, which are just irritants to the eyes and nose. That's what gives mold that kind of um, pungent and uh, unique smell where most people can tell you it smells like there's mold. Um, and then the one that's probably the most controversial is the mycotoxins. That's the poisons that are produced by these molds. That's uh, very similar to poisonous mushrooms. If you end up eating or breathing too many of these poisons, uh, that can impact your system as well. So uh, let's take a look at some of the exposures to the mold and where that comes from. Uh, it can lead to uh, sensitization. If you get into a situation like this where you're um, removing the cushions, uh, so to speak, and getting into some of these hidden spaces in the uh, vessel, like you can see there in the photo. Um, who's doing that? Are you doing that as an inspector? And as you see something or smell something like that, are you taking the actual precautions to protect yourself? Because you can do this one time and maybe not have a problem, or maybe do have a problem, or you can do it a hundred times and not have a problem. But the 101 time, that 101st time, uh, your body may just say, you know what, I've had enough of this. And you can actually become what they call sensitized. And there is a, a pretty well documented medical condition now called CIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And that creates a, or, or is um, um, demonstrated by a number of different things. Uh, Many times people have what they call um, brain fog and um, memory issues, uh, sometimes balance and neuro other neurological things, uh, muscle aches and pains, tingling in their mouth, uh, just because uh, a lot of these, uh, what we call the target molds, the five that I showed on the uh, red arrows previously, those, many of those are neurotoxins. They produce the chemicals that are actually neurotoxins and um, that can be dangerous for people. So um, the other interesting thing that's coming out here is it's both a um, indication of the toxicity of the mold and the susceptibility of the person and the susceptibility. There are many people that are genetically predisposed to being susceptible to different types of molds. So this whole idea where we 
track the human genome and now can identify some of this. Um, there are tests that people can take now to tell you if you're going to be susceptible to mold uh, problems. All right, let's talk about um, from assuming that you believe me that these can be dangerous both to you as a surveyor and to the occupants of the boat afterwards. Uh, the question then becomes where can you find these and uh, where should you be on the lookout as you do your surveys? And the first thing I would say, obviously, is that if you've got open or exposed uh, surfaces, like you can see here on this uh, bit of a smaller vessel here with an outboard motor on it, a couple of outboards, um, that would be considered an issue that should be um, identified in your report. You could look at this and say, well, that's just residue from it sitting out and uh, dirt building up and everything. But um, the reality is if you look closer, you can see that some of it um, Mike, if you can put your arrow down to the bottom right there underneath where the, I'm sorry, bottom left. Uh, sorry, I'll get my right and left there. So up on top there, you can see that might just be a dirt deposition right there. But if you go below where you see the um, hatching on the fabric down to the very lower bottom portion of it, you'll see that starting to look like colonies. You're right there. Those are rounder, uh, not just uh, dirt deposition, that area there is very, very much looking like that's going to be um, some sort of fungal growth. So uh, wherever the water and the temperature are favorable is uh, what we're going to talk about here in our next slide. You're likely to see fungal contamination on a marine vessel. So some of the more uh, typical areas uh, the shrink wrap boats in storage because you get uh, temperature fluctuations that creates, um, uh, you know, humidity uh, changes and then the um, deposition of the water on the various surfaces inside the uh, shrink wrap, uh, obviously bilges and heads. Uh, some things that people don't uh, normally look at uh, potentially as part of your surveys are the HVAC ductwork and even the diffuser vents. Um, closets uh, are big for mold growth just because they don't get as much air movement uh, on an active boat. And then the different fabrics, uh, whether they be the exterior grade fabrics or the interior grade fabrics, like on some of the super yachts and things that Mark was talking about previously, um, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to have a yacht like that and have that impacted by mold and not pick that up somewhere in your discussions. So let's talk about how we identify the uh, molds and then even assessing the risk. So you've seen a number of pictures like this. Uh, these are vessels. Uh, a lot of these are smaller vessels. They've just been exposed to the weather, uh, the dirt and uh, debris, and then the mold builds up uh, on some of that. Is that a significant risk for your uh, potential buyer? And the answer is, it's a big enough risk that you have to call it out. Uh, whether you're going to, uh, you know, classify it and say that they, you know, shouldn't purchase the vessel because of it or something, that's probably not what you guys do. You just point out the issues and then let the seller and the buyer kind of sort out some of the uh, details on that. But yes, it would be our uh, position as a mold expert that this would have to be appropriately cleaned um, because even if they're going to be operating this on the open water, uh, the fact of the matter is the dilution of the air, even on a moving vessel, may not be enough to counteract the uh, mold spores that would come from sitting on one of these cushions and, and having some uh, significant exposure without that being cleaned. So again, uh, you're going to take it from here. You're going to do a uh, visual assessment as far as our next slide goes. Um, and that's going to include uh, both a review of how it looks and how it smells. So uh, other more um, specific areas or more specific things we can do, you could certainly take surface samples and air samples if it became a big issue, um, perhaps a commercial vessel and you're trying to figure out uh, whether the entire crew quarter is impacted or something like that. Um, we don't have enough time in this presentation to get into the details of the actual sampling procedures. Uh, there'll be some information on me 
at the end of the presentation where we'll be happy to um, you know, answer those sorts of questions for people. But the, the purpose is to just use your eyes, use your nose, use your brain, and just make sure that this gets listed on your uh, survey forms as a potential issue. Uh, that's really what you're trying to do is bring awareness to the situation. And whether it's, uh, uh, you know, the algae that's growing on the rope there or the mold that's actually growing on some of the fabrics, uh, some of that should be pointed out. Um, as far as the inspections go, if you wanted to take it up a step, uh, one of the things you can do is to get a moisture meter. And that would help you determine whether there is a a significant problem in the substrate. Uh, many of these are uh, what they call pinless or just surface moisture meters that can help you. And um, you can see there in the picture on the left that um, if the uh, little um, indicator is down uh, in the green or the yellow range, that's probably uh, not enough moisture to cause the mold to grow. If it moved farther over to the right uh, and got into the orange or the red range, that would tell you that there's uh, gonna be more of an indication for the uh, mold to grow. The surveyor on the right in that picture is actually using a biotape sample to collect a sample of some of the material uh, down there by the uh, strut to determine whether that's a um, actual mold growth or not. Uh, and an outside scenario like that, I'm not sure if I would uh, you know, necessarily recommend that you do the sampling as much as just note it and take a picture of it, put it into your report. Uh, we do want to focus on some of the bad odors, though, because that's going to be a dead giveaway for a lot of your clients. So in this particular case, the mold was growing underneath some of the uh, surface uh, cushions and other uh, fabrics and stuff. And as that got peeled away, uh, you can see some of the uh, deterioration and the water damage. And, and in this particular case, it was simply the, the nose nose in that the, um, the surveyor smelled it first and then just did a little bit more investigation. And then here you go with your pictures that go into your report and away you go. So if it's bad enough, uh, particularly because vessels are a lot of times enclosed, um, you know, when you get down uh, below the top there, uh, uh, on the deck, anything below deck, you can generally, if there's a significant amount of mold growing, you're going to smell it. Uh, and that may be your first clue, even as uh, before the visual. All right, let's jump into the uh, remediation standard of care. This is a pretty typical scenario. You've got a, um, you know, seat with the cushions and the fabric and everything on it. And this has been exposed. Uh, now we don't know how much of that is just dirt deposition versus mold. And I would say on the surface area where you can see some handprints and stuff on the seat, that looks almost like it's more um, dirt. And sometimes the dirt actually acts as a protective film and the mold will grow on the dirt or there may be uh, certain things in the soot or the dirt that keeps it from growing. But if you look on the uh, vertical edges of both the top cushion and the bottom cushion, you can start to see again, the more pattern, uh, small circular dots, that's gonna be uh, much more of an indication of uh, physical growth of mold. So how are you gonna address this in your recommendations? Well, some of that may depend on the vessel itself. If you're talking a cruise uh, liner uh, where they've got thousands of passengers and uh, you know nearly as many uh, crew members, and there's some level of significant mold, you may need a crew like this to come on board, a specialized crew of mold remediation uh, specialists come on board and clean it up. And you can see they've got their suits and their mask and all of that. Uh, very similar to as if they're doing, uh, you know, cleaning for the COVID uh, virus or something. But um, just if you're going to do anything in terms of some basic language in your report, I would steal these three bullet points. If you point out on a vessel survey that there is you know, some material that appears to be fungal growth or mold, and that you should then recommend that it be properly addressed, I would go so far as to list these three points, that 
as that is being um, addressed, we would like to make sure that the workers who are doing the uh, remediation are protected, that any of the occupants that may come onto the vessel are gonna be protected. In other words, that it's done properly. And then finally, uh, linking back into what Mark and a number of other uh, individuals have talked about. We also need to protect the vessel because on uh, certain materials, the fungal growth and the mold will actually be a uh, material that will deteriorate the surfaces. It's almost um, you know, similar to a form of corrosion, if you will, but it's just a biological corrosion in terms of breaking down the wood or the glues or the rubbers or some of the other uh, materials like that. Um, as you think about it, as uh, people move forward and say, well, what's okay or what's not okay? And isn't there mold everywhere? And the answer is, well, yes, there's mold spores all around us. That's why we never, in the mold remediation industry, um, you should never use anything in your reports like, well, you should clean it until it's mold free. That's just not appropriate because there's always mold around us just from the natural environment. So the terminology is if they're gonna clean or remediate, you want it to be returned to a normal fungal ecology. Um, the other terminology that's used in our industry is what they call condition two, and that's uh, secondary contamination with the spores. You may not even see that. And then uh, condition three, the worst, is gonna be the visible colonies. And you can see some of that on the carpet on this um, vessel here. Uh, toward the door, there's less of it, but as you move toward the um, uh, front of the vessel, you, you'll see the uh, pictures like the close-up. Um, and that could be as simple as somebody spilled some drink and there's a sugary, um, you know, soda or something that landed on the carpet. And then over time, not only did it turn color and stain, but it may actually have um, supported the mold growth on that particular carpet. So what do we do when we have it on that uh, sort of uh, surface, whether it be carpet or fabric or chairs or whatever? Uh, it's all about the physical removal and the cleaning uh, of the mold. And there's some uh, fairly unique challenges. Uh, I don't know, Mike, if you've uh, jumped it yet and I'm not seeing it or uh, but there's some fairly unique uh, challenges of remediating mold on vessels. And let me give you just a few of them. So um, not only do you have, in many cases, some fairly um, unique and exotic materials, but you also have the fact that the top side of these vessels are exposed. And of course, yes, that is a joke with the uh, bikini clad um, individuals sitting there exposing themselves uh, for our enjoyment. Um, in addition to the fact that it's exposed to the weather and the moisture and everything, there's a lot of small spaces on vessels uh, that are hard to access. Uh, bilge pumps and underneath where we have different sorts of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, storage areas and toolkits and even fire extinguishers and stuff in different areas. In addition to just being exposed, we're also operating in a wet environment. And that, of course, is, you know, just magic, so to speak, for the mold itself. Um, anytime it has moisture, anytime it's got the right temperature, it is going to continue to flourish. Um, another thing that makes it difficult to um, deal with, or at least makes it interesting for you as uh, surveyors to look at, is the fact that there's a lot of different materials on boats. There's woods, there's fabrics, there's vinyls, there's um, wallpapers, there's uh, just all sorts of items that are out there. And then um, another unique challenge that you guys are facing is the fact that, uh, as we mentioned a couple of times previously, many of these uh, vessels are stored and wrapped for extended periods of time. And so when you get to that stage where you're enclosing them and then you deal with all of the humidity issues and the temperature change, the, the potential for the condensation on different surfaces. And even in uh, situations like the photo here on the right, the 
Um, just the fact that that's cold weather and there's some snow on the ground, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's 100% going to stop the mold from going inside that enclosed area. There might just be enough of a temperature change as the sun hits that white uh, tarping to then get it warm enough inside there to get your condensation and your uh, mold growth. So let's um, talk about this in terms of once you've identified it, what are you going to tell the seller or the buyer that they need to do? And the answer is, as you can see in some of these uh, uh, arrows, um, wherever the physical mold growth is, it should be removed. And there's a number of different ways that we can do this. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to removing the mold, whether that's through the use of chemicals or just um, uh, good old hand labor. So if we uh, look at the next one, that uh, kind of tells us our uh, scenario in terms of protecting individuals while they're doing the removal. Um, when you're within an arm's length uh, of your face to the surface, you have to be very careful. You don't want to just, uh, as in the picture on the right here where she's got uh, one of our like COVID uh, style mask on, that's not going to be adequate for uh, protecting you from the spores. And uh, um, some of that is just uh, related to the fact that the um, distribution of the viral particles actually can be a lower concentration where the mask can be helpful. But in a situation like this where you're actually rubbing or sanding or scraping or brushing that mold within literally, uh, you know, probably 30 inches of your face, then um, you're going to need additional protection for your respiratory system. And that would include uh, some uh, real respirator like you can see there in the picture on the left. As far as mold contaminated contents go, um, the big question always becomes, well, I'm sorry, let me back up and say this. If you want to spend enough money, anything can be cleaned. The question becomes, why do you want to waste money cleaning something that is going to cost you so much you'd be better off replacing it? So the two examples here, you've got some of your uh, floats and your bumpers there. And those are going to be hard plastic. Uh, the one has been cleaned already. The other one has some uh, fungal growth on it. Uh, that can be cleaned. And that's going to be very inexpensive and probably less expensive than replacing those uh, bumpers. On the other hand, we eventually could clean and deal with that mattress and box springs. But to do it right, the amount of money that you'd have to spend on that would be so, uh, so extensive that you'd be better off just replacing those. So that's really what the issue is going to come down to with the mold on contents is if it's porous material, uh, then it's most likely going to be um, more cost effective to remove it than to clean it. So the next uh, slide here has uh, the, the, a number of uh, examples very quickly. Um, mattresses and box springs and stuff, probably replacement. Clothes, probably replacement. Um, but the chairs and the, I know that those aren't coming from uh, vessels, and yes, it's, unless it's a um, you know, a pretty decent size uh, yacht or something. But uh, leather and uh, couches and things like that can be cleaned and probably uh, worth doing a good job cleaning those chairs and couches as compared to just replacing them. All right, let's talk about cleaning and treating. Um, not the uh, greatest photo here, but you can see the front section of this uh, uh, chair uh, on the top side of a, a vessel there and the chair to the uh, far right have been uh, cleaned and treated. And a lot of times that can be a single product that will help you get the uh, fungal growth off of these primarily non-porous surfaces. So if you have these vinyls and these uh, different sorts of all weather surfaces on the boats, those typically can be cleaned and will respond very well. Uh, what you want to do is make sure that you're using a product that's designed for that sort of material so you're not going to do long-term damage uh, to that um, cushion and stuff. And there's uh, very specific uh, chemicals 
both in the marine industry and the mold remediation industry that allows us to do that. And I am in favor, by the way, of using the uh, materials that clean and treat at the same time. If there's a large scale removal, sometimes as we said with the yachts and the, and the um, cruise lines and things, you're gonna have to call in uh, the professional folks and they are gonna have the right personal protective equipment as well as some specialty chemicals to help us get through that. Um, typically, we're gonna clean surfaces before we uh, protect them. Although, like I said, on some of the vinyls and things on the uh, pleasure craft, um, there's, there's combination where you can clean and treat at the same time. But uh, uh, something like this where it's going to be a cruise line, uh, generally it's gonna be a two-step process. They're gonna clean everything and then they're going to use um, usually a fog or a sprayer to put down an antifungal uh, surface treatment afterwards. Many of those are very safe from a health standpoint. They're um, silver iodine solutions and things like that. So uh, they can be dangerous if you're spraying them on and actually being exposed to the um, uh, mist in the air. But once they're on the surfaces and have dried, they're actually very safe and do prevent the mold from growing. Uh, let's finish up here with just the uh, uh, last couple of slides and uh, perhaps give some time for some uh, questions. Um, <laughs> I love the uh, quote there, the best way to know, uh, to sound like you know what you're talking about is to actually know what you're talking about. Uh, and so from our perspective, me giving advice to marine surveyors as a uh, mold or as a fungal expert, I would just say you want to make sure that anybody who's going to be involved in responding to your survey where you call out mold on a vessel, you, you want to always encourage them to take the right safety precautions. So whether they're going to be doing cleaning or whether they're going to have somebody do some inspecting or if it's down in a hold or it's a confined area in a bilge or something like that that you're not sure about, just make sure that they are, are protecting themselves because the mold in the confined space brings you into all those other safety issues that we were talking about before in terms of confined spaces with um, bad air and uh, entrapment and all that other stuff. Um, as far as making specific recommendations for chemicals to use, I would stay away from that unless you really get deep into this and realize that there's all sorts of chemistry that can be used. As I said, um, uh, heavy metals like silver and copper, ions are being used. There's um, uh, more green sorts of uh, herb products like thyme oil from the herb thyme uh, that is considered to be a botanical. There's quaternary ammonium compounds, which are typically used uh, for uh, health, um, 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 you know, like hospitals and food service areas and things like that. So my best advice is just uh, alert them to the presence of the mold, tell them that it should be dealt with, and then allow the um, owners and the uh, buyers and sellers to uh, sort it out using uh, some basic um, safety procedures like we talked about here. All right, I'm gonna close with a, a little bit, as I said, on just some liability issues, just like four slides on liability issues. Again, we've seen plenty of pictures of of uh, fungal growth on the different um, uh, uh, surfaces here. So from a liability perspective as a marine surveyor, here's some things that you really have to be concerned about. One is just failing to identify these during the survey. Um, you pull a cover here on the bilge and it looks nasty and uh, yeah, that's about as far as I want to go on that particular portion of my survey. Well, I don't know. Is that just dirty or is that some of the uh, fungal material there? If it looks like mold, uh, you might want to call it out as potential mold and at a minimum recommend that they have some uh, follow-up uh, uh, testing or additional experts to look at it for them. But you don't want to be you, you'd rather mention something that could be mold that isn't mold than not have it in your report because that's going to be 
uh, a potential liability for you as the surveyor. Um, another problem that's gonna, uh, that I've seen uh, run into um, things uh, is when the surveyor puts it in their report and then mentions some sort of uh, remediation technique that isn't considered within the standard of care. Oh, you can just paint XYZ product on that to cover it up. That's not going to go over well if a sensitized person comes on because in essence, you're not removing that, you're covering it. That mold actually can grow underneath uh, many of these different paints and things. So you can, you can actually force the mold to grow inside, actually making it worse by covering it than, than if you treated it properly. So again, my recommendation for most marine surveyors is uh, alert them to the presence or potential presence of this, tell them that there could be an issue and uh, let them know that if they are going to take care of it, they need to protect the people who are gonna be doing the work as well as potential occupants. But don't get into uh, detailed prescriptions in terms of what they should be doing to protect it. Um, one of the last things here then is you, you have to be careful as you present the information. It is informational it is not, you shouldn't be scaring them or downplaying that. So the terms that we use in our classes here when we talk to people about mold remediation are mold minimizers and fungophobics. And that's two extremes. You don't wanna be on either extreme. You need to be in the center. And that means that you need to point this out and you say, yes, that is an issue that appears to be fungal growth on the ceiling of this cabin. And that should be, taken care of properly, that would include removal of the mold uh, and potentially by a professional uh, source. Um, you don't want to uh, tell them that, oh, it's just a little bit of mold. It's probably not going to hurt anybody. Or you don't want to go, oh my goodness, that stuff right there to the left of the hatch looks like black circles. That could be stacking mattress. That could kill you. You present the news. Uh, you know, make it objective and leave the um, uh, hysteria or the uh, poo-pooing out of it, right? Um, if they have questions, there's um, other folks you can direct them to. RGS is actually a, a group here in the States that services these boats and, and is very uh, well informed with the different products and stuff in terms of how to clean and, and uh, uh, protect them. And obviously you can uh, send them back to Wondermakers. We would be happy to uh, give them the uh, benefit of our experience. So let me just close with this. Uh, first of all, I have learned uh, over the last two years uh, quite a bit about your industry. And I am incredibly impressed with the, you folks as surveyors. As, as Mark was alluding to at the end of his presentation, there's a lot of complicated stuff that you guys have to know and understand. And I almost feel bad throwing one more thing. Uh, Mike convinced me, it's all Mike's problem, right? He convinced me to do this because you guys have so much that you have to address already. But it is important that you just be aware of this. And uh, even as you bring out there, you can see in the two pictures there, um, if that's what it looked like at the beginning of your survey, you would want to make sure that by the time that vessel got sold, perhaps, or at least that they negotiate that, it should look like the bottom uh, um, picture there. But I, I want to point out, as, as much as I appreciate you and as much as I'm trying not to make your life more difficult, you absolutely have a duty to understand this. The, the world is changing. Mold is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And... Uh, you know, you can't just ignore it and say, well, we've never put that on a survey in the past, so why do I have to start doing it now? Um, at a minimum, if it looks like it could be, you should document that it could be present. Even if you don't know for sure, just use the language, it could be fungal contamination or mold. And last but not least, I would say, as you get into this and become more familiar with this, 
again, you will become the professionals. You don't have to solve all their problems for them. You have to alert them that there could be a problem. And then you have to be that bridge that, that gets them to the people that helps them figure out how to deal with it. Um, uh, I, I will just add a little plug here for Wonder Makers and for Mike at, uh, at uh, IIMS and uh, let you know that uh, we have actually trained a number of contractors in England as well as uh, other areas around the uh, globe. We've got a number of folks in Australia uh, that have uh, gone through some of our training courses that could be helpful to you. Um, and we're always happy to answer people's uh, emails and give them what we call the free 10 minutes of explanation. If it gets more than that, it becomes more complicated. We have a system where they can, you know, purchase uh, consultation services in, in small blocks. But uh, just realize this is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic is going to make this more of an issue for us because as people get used to having cleaner environments and disinfecting surfaces and things, the mold is going to be uh, even more of an issue uh, that, that's going to just alert people that, hey, there's an issue. We need to deal with this. Whew, that's uh, a lot uh, of information. Yeah, Ma Michael, well, I, I, brilliant. I mean, we've never tackled mold before as a subject. Um, I, I think this all comes down, in my opinion, to um, the duty of care. That's what you were. Uh, point you were very much making is the duty of care that a surveyor gives to the client and better to say that you suspect something and uh, it requires further investigation is, uh, you know, to leave it out so um, yes it's um, it's chastening really and I also agree with you, of course that these guys do a pretty uh, amazing job anyway it's complex enough and yeah here's another thing to think about but you know it is the reality isn't it um, You've got to be very, very clever with this stuff. So I have got some questions that have been posted online. Let, let me just bring them to you. Uh, sure. Mark, Mark says, can you briefly talk about algae that can be found within diesel fuel tanks? This is becoming a massive challenge for surveyors to identify and report on, and its consequences can be extremely costly to repair. Okay, well, so algae is a different uh, actual organism. It's a, it's a, a different kingdom of organisms than the fungal material. Um, but it shares some similarities. Obviously, it's going to grow in a wet environment. And um, the, whether it's the fungi or the algae or some combination of them that form what we call these biofilms, and that's probably a better term for it than just the algae in the uh, um, diesel tanks and stuff. It's, it's most likely a combination of bacteria and fungal organisms and algae and even some other weird things that are out there. But all in all, they create these biofilms. The biofilms do bad things. They plug up lines. They uh, get on these surfaces and will actually start to deteriorate the surfaces depending on what sort of, of organisms are in that specific biofilm. And then they can even cause corrosion and uh, start to jam things up. So that's why the, uh, from my understanding, uh, that's why they become so expensive to uh, fix because if you don't get it all out and you leave a little bit behind, remember we talked about the starter spores and so those conditions in the diesel tank probably aren't going to change much. And so if it's got the algae growing in there or the biofilm, you've got to get it completely out. And then generally there's going to be some sort of treatment to keep it from coming back because otherwise, if you miss even a little bit, um, it, you know, it's, it's likely going to re once it's already grown in there, it's going to uh, be more likely to regrow. So uh, another Michael would like to know uh, to avoid mold, might you recommend tea tree like Canberra? Well, that's got to be one of our Australian friends because the tea tree <laughs> oil is um, big down in Australia and it is a good botanical. Um, obviously, it's getting all around the, the world and everything. Yes, that is one of the botanicals that can be effective on mold. What I would say, however, is that you have to be careful uh, you don't want to just go out to the uh, health food store and buy tea tree oil and assume that that's going to work. Uh, what you would want to do is, is look at some of the products that are designed with the tea tree oil and are, are actually tested as 
antifungal um, materials. And then you can use that. The, the nice thing about the tea tree oil and some of the other botanicals is those are key elements for both cleaners and preventatives. So uh, remember I was showing you some of those um, uh, surfaces on the top side on some of those uh, cushions and things and, and uh, showed you how bright and white it was. A lot of those that are, are single pass cleaners and treatments uh, and preventatives are going to be the botanicals and, and many of those may contain your tea tree oil. Mm. So okay. I'm thumbs up on tea tree, but just make sure you're getting a product where it's been uh, tested for that sort of material. And final question comes from another Mike, Mike Chadwick. Uh, could you talk about, say something about boats that have been or that have sunk in dirty canals and cleaning them? So when you are recovering vessels that have been sunk, um, you know, there's typically a lot of muck and then um, things that have to be cleaned off from there. Um, it's interesting, there's been a number of studies that have shown that uh, some of those vessels and other objects that are in these dirty canals and things do not grow a lot of mold. And you think to yourself, well, what the heck, what's going on there? And the answer is there's so much crap in the water and in the sediment as in residual pesticides and heavy metals from lead paint and um, uh, fertilizers and all sorts of stuff, and oil, a lot of oil and, and uh, uh, fuel uh, residue in, in a lot of that canal water, that the bigger issue is getting rid of the dirt and the uh, filth rather than necessarily a lot of the uh, fungal contamination. So um, that is actually from a couple of cases that we worked on with uh, boats that were uh, damaged by uh, way back in Hurricane Katrina in 2005 mm -hmm. and how they got swamped. And if you know anything about the New Orleans area, it is not a pretty place in terms of clean water in uh, uh, Lake Pontchartrain and some of the other areas where some of these vessels got uh, swamped by the hurricane. So, yeah. Michael, thank you very much indeed. Fabulous. Uh, and I, I think that's a lesson to us all. Thank you, I appreciate you giving up your, your time. And um, good luck, and I hope we'll catch up with you next year. I appreciate it very much. And let me just uh, close by saying one more time, I am so appreciative and uh, you know impressed by what you guys do as marine surveyors. And I would just say, keep up the good work, and if I can help you, just shoot me an email. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike.